yeah, that's, so I think we'll start with the next talk. Michael Hen Dr. Michael Hennigan has already joined, so we look forward to your talk on uh, immunosuppression in post in autoimmune liver disease post transplantation. So, so over to Dr. Malik, Michael. We're going to have pre recorded video of Dr. Michael Hennigan, and uh, after the video, we'll have a discussion with him. We can start. So thank you very much, everybody, for the kind invitation to speak at this meeting. I'm sorry that I'm not there in person. My task today is to discuss post-transplant immunosuppression in autoimmune liver disease. And this is the outline of my talk. So you have heard this morning the concepts associated with standard immunosuppression and what I will be talking about is managing by exception in PBC, PSC and autoimmune hepatitis. So you'll be all familiar with this. John O'Grady published now two decades ago the famous TMC trial that established tacrolimus-based immunosuppression as the premier first choice immunosuppression in transplantation. And one year and five year survival endpoints were better for death, retransplantation and treatment failure, irrespective of whether or not it was immune or non-immune reasons. The concept of renal sparing immunosuppression or induction regimens has evolved in the noughties and in the last decade. And essentially the concept of delayed tacrolimus with induction therapy with an IL-2 blocker and a mycophenolator azathioprine has been adopted widely. But what we also know is that there are multiple factors that relate to graft loss and complications that can occur. Firstly, you can get recurrence of underlying liver disease, such as PBC, autoimmune hepatitis, and PSC. There are consequences, both intended and non-intended for immunosuppression minimization strategies. Rejection in autoimmune liver disease has an effect on graft outcome long term and of course adherence young patients are more likely to have autoimmune disease and they often have issues with medication so when you have issues with the liver graft attention to detail is critically important there are some caveats also in immunosuppression management in autoimmune liver diseases. We know that some patients are at higher immunological risk. That's clear for younger patients with autoimmune hepatitis, primary sclerosis, and cholangitis. These patients are also more likely to undergo retransplantation for rejection. So these immune-mediated liver diseases deserve a personalized approach to care. In many respects, they're very similar to patients who are highly sensitized. These are patients that we have to focus on. And indeed, unlike the majority of patients who are transplanted for non-immune reasons, late rejection impacts upon graft survival and graft loss. Turning to specific diseases, such as primary biliary cholangitis, this is a good systematic review looking at disease recurrence and what we know, although not really confirmed in large prospective data, is the fact that the risk of PBC recurrence seems to be less with cyclosporin-based immunosuppression compared to tacrolimus-based immunosuppression. The data, newer data, are derived from the global PBC group. Uh, 785 patients who received liver transplantation for PBC, 
and then 240 patients ultimately with PBC recurrence, histologically proven, and no other alternative cause of graft dysfunction identified. And what is key is that the factors associated with PBC recurrence were the following. Age at diagnosis of PBC, younger patients diagnosed under the age of 50, more likely to have PBC recurrence. Age at liver transplantation, whether patients are less than or older than 60 years, younger patients again with PBC, more likely to have disease recurrence. And of course, this same type of situation where there is a differential in disease recurrence between patients who receive tacrolimus and patients who receive cyclosporin. And you can see that PBC recurs in a steady state, approximately 55% after 20 years. In terms of patient and graft survival, of course, PBC remains a great indication for transplant. The effect of disease recurrence, however, means that graft survival is reduced statistically and overall survival is reduced in patients who are transplanted for PBC. There has been a lot of interest over the last few years and this is again a cohort study of 780 patients, 16 centers, with the outcomes being PBC recurrence, graft loss or death. 190 patients who received preemptive ursodeoxycholic acid at standard treatment doses, lower rates of recurrence, reduced graft loss, reduced liver related death, reduced all cause death, and indeed a survival gain of over two years over a 20 year time frame. Turning towards primary sclerosis and cholangitis, from an immunosuppression standpoint, there are no specific caveats other than ensuring that good levels of immunosuppression are achieved. But what I would bring to your attention today is that conventionally thought of as a disease primarily of men, actually what we're seeing from the ELTR database is that you have increased numbers of women with PSC heading and receiving transplantation. There is also a definite reduced graft survival in men compared to women. With regard to risk factors, what is increasingly evident is that the presence of cholestasis uh, in the third month post-transplant, excluding other causes, is something that seems to be a marker of likelihood of whether or not PSC will recur. So patients with cholestasis more likely to have disease recurrence. And there have been also systematic reviews and meta-analysis in this field. So colectomy prior to liver transplantation, we know that inflammatory bowel disease activity is important. So colectomy protects, reduces risk of recurrence. But what I would focus on is the risk factors for recurrence here and bring your attention to graft dysfunction episodes of rejection, multiple episodes of rejection. Colectomy before transplant, this is the weighted risk. Inflammatory bowel disease, we know that disease that is out of control or pouchitis post-transplant increases the risk of recurrence. Cholangiocarcinoma pre-transplant. And again, these are the hazard ratios, almost a twofold incidence of disease recurrence in the context of PSC-related disease. For autoimmune hepatitis, the controversy is truly around steroid inclusion or continuation. At King's College Hospital, we are, people, we are a program that continues to keep steroids 
similarly with PBC. And we know that this group of patients, if you have autoimmune hepatitis, this is now the greatest unmet need for patients with undergoing transplantation in terms of outcome. Some key factors for recurrence of autoimmune hepatitis after transplantation, obviously uh, the recurrence risk is continuous and up to 40% of patients will evolve this once they get beyond 10 years. But what is also clear is active autoimmune liver disease going into transplantation is a marker of recurrence. High IgG levels and then the findings on the explant. Moderately severe inflammatory activity versus burnt out disease. Substantial difference in terms of the risk of disease recurrence. Just a word of warning. There is another issue that actually, if you get patients with severe autoimmune liver disease and recurrence, basically these patients are at risk of increasing sepsis if they are preloaded with high doses of steroids going into transplantation. With the incidence rates of uh, complications coming after the introduction of steroids and after the onset of grade to coma. So something to be aware of. For overlap patients, what you can see, and again, this is a systematic review of the rates. If you do not have a confirmed exact diagnosis, you seem to do better. So where there is ambiguity uh, in relation to diagnosis, you do worse. So better to have a clear identified disease process going into transplant if you have unresolved issues, risk of an overlap syndrome. This is the group that is highly likely to recur. Just a word of warning in our patients with autoimmune liver diseases undergoing transplantation. There are certainly some unintended consequences of calcineurin inhibition minimization strategies. For patients with autoimmune liver disease, their risk of chronic rejection is higher, more likely to have antibody-mediated rejection. And of course, we have this consideration in non-immune liver diseases of plasma cell rejection, or what has been referred to in the past as de novo autoimmune hepatitis. Chronic rejection, of course, biopsy is important. What you can do is very much dependent on cellularity. If you have some cellularity, augment the baseline immunosuppression, get the tacrolimus levels up, add double, triple therapy, and deal with this. On the other hand, if you have disease where you just have no cellularity, then the issue is going to be forced and head towards transplantation. I mentioned plasma cell rich rejection. The terms that we dislike now are de novo autoimmune hepatitis, graft dysfunction mimicking autoimmune hepatitis and so forth. This is a rare condition sometimes seen in people transplanted for non-autoimmune liver diseases, but it manifests uh, in, a, in a way very similar to classical autoimmune hepatitis, elevated IgG, it responds to classical autoimmune hepatitis immunosuppression. And when this occurs, long-term corticosteroid therapy is mandatory. So to conclude, you should be in your practice, applying a personalized medicine approach to patients with autoimmune liver diseases. I hope I have convinced you that the consequences of rejection are greater for patients who have established autoimmune liver diseases. And thinking about immunosuppression management and optimizing fine tuning, this is what will protect patients against disease recurrence. So, therefore, a more personalized approach to care delivery 
is what is important. Thank you so much for taking time to listen to our pre my presentation, and I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hennigan. Uh, I hope I, I'm audible, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll hand over the mic to Dr. Rakhi uh, to take over the discussion and uh, some questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hennigan. That was, a, in fact, a very light, nice talk. And uh, I just had a few questions. Uh, you showed us the data of PBC, where tacrolimus was associated with higher risk of rec recurrence. So uh, what is the data on the rejection rate in the patients? Uh, so what do you suggest as a protocol in PBC patients? So this is where experience and data differ. In most established transplant programs that have the scars of experience with cyclosporin, uh, irrespective of this data, we tend to still persist with tacrolimus-based immunosuppression. The difficulty in this situation is that there is not good randomized prospective data to favor cyclosporin use. Uh, because although the consequences of uh, rejection in PBC are probably not as severe as in PSC, what you are ultimately dependent on is uh, avoiding some of the other side effects from cyclosporin use. So I am not sure that any of the major transplant programs around the world are still acting upon this data. Now, it seems counterintuitive. What it, so what I would say is what is required is, uh, is, is better data. But in our practice, let's say here at King's, we are still attack and spread uh, primary therapy. And the only exception and the only caveat is that we still tend to continue prednisolone long-term in our PPC patients we continue prednisolone in our autoimmune patients, we don't do it in the PSC patients unless they need steroids for their colitis. So that's a, lo a long answer to a short question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michael, for uh, being with us. I'm really thankful to you. Tell me one thing. Uh, in those patients uh, who develop a recurrence of autoimmune liver disease post-transplant or a de novo autoimmune hepatitis, like, you know, we published four cases at some time in 2018, you know. So how would you treat these patients uh, who have autoimmune liver disease in the post transplant scenario? Is it different from uh, otherwise naive autoimmune liver disease? Um, so that's a great question. I think everything depends on the severity. If you have, uh, if you have what looks like a plasma cell rejection, it will we would tend to treat with 40 milligrams of prednisolone or prednisone with the addition of azathioprine if azathioprine has not been given. I don't think there's any benefit from intravenous steroids in that setting unless you've got other features of T-cell mediated rejection. Um, and I would say then that for the de novo autoimmune hepatitis or plasma cell rejection or indeed recurrent autoimmune hepatitis, the key is to make sure that you get either mycophenolate or azathioprine in decent doses established so that you get down to uh, lower doses of steroids that are more manageable. I find the whole discussion about whether or not you can withdraw steroids and autoimmune hepatitis post-transplant a difficult one for two reasons. One, most patients who are transplanted for autoimmune hepatitis have been on steroids for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So I think many of them are already adrenally suppressed. So we don't prove it all the time. So it makes it very difficult conceptually to withdraw steroids in those patients. For patients who have a much shorter course, the ASLD guidelines did a meta-analysis around this, and they said there's no they, they said there's no recommendation you can make either way, but you're making a you're making a decision on 
no data. So I think uh, it's um, a lot of this is experiential. Sanjeev. Thank yeah, and thank you. That's absolutely, you know, uh, right. And I appreciate that very much. I think uh, Rakit Banish Mandra has some question in the chat box. We'll see that. So Manish uh, has asked the question, low-dose prednisolone recommended to undergo transplant is conventionally used in AIH otherwise. My practice is yes, five, seven and a half milligrams. And of course, it's dictated by what I, what I said. These patients have been on steroids for 10, 20 years. And what would be a desirable regimen of immunosuppression and autoimmune liver disease post-transplant? I think it's very much discussed. This we discussed, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And sir, can I just ask one more question? Uh, what is your I experience? can't say no. Okay, sorry. So I just <laughs> want to know what is your experience on sequential syndromes uh, in the post-transplant setting? Do you see uh, sequential syndromes uh, developing in the post-transplant? Any experience? Um, I think we have seen it occasionally, but it's rare. Usually what happens in terms of sequential is they go into transplant with one diagnosis, and when we get the explant, it's not what we think. It's either, P it turns out to be PSC. I, I, have, I don't think I have really seen an evolution of recurrent autoimmune hepatitis into something else. If you have patients like that, write them up. Sure. So we had analyzed the data and we found a very small set of patients who were actually getting frank sequential syndromes. So we picked up on the imagings and uh, the histology, repeat paired biopsies. I think you should, you should write you, these up. Thank you.